Monica McCarrick, just your average mom, suddenly finds herself in the middle of a nightmare. She's been feeling the tension building for weeks. The James Patterson thriller she's glued to, it's like it's ripped straight from her own life. Then there's the horror movie her fiancé is writing. Let's just say it hits a little too close to home. Danger lurks around every corner, threatening her and her precious twin babies. So, what does she do? She grabs a samurai sword of all things, ready to protect them at any cost. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris. You won't believe the shocking truth behind this story. But before we jump in, just a reminder, if you like getting all the crime in half the time, Amy and I are here three times a week with new recaps. So remember to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And when it comes to this story, be sure to stick around to the end for a twist that will make you sick. Let's recap. Her fiancé is going to kill her and sell her daughters into sexual slavery. If she doesn't act fast, her three-year-old twins will suffer a fate worse than death. Even her soon-to-be mother-in-law is in on it. Monica can't beat them. They're too well-organized. They have spies and cameras all over the place. They know everything about her. They've even sent their spies into her apartment. Then, on October 12, 2010, her apartment goes up in flames. Firefighters push their way through the door and into to a scene straight out of a nightmare. Overturned high chairs, blood splattered everywhere, and a children's cartoon still playing on a laptop. The chilling aftermath of a horrifying event. Then they see it. A copy of James Patterson's Double Cross on the floor, open to a page with the haunting words, my daughter is dead. It's more than just words on a page. It seems to be some kind of a message because the bodies of Monica's three-year-old twin daughters, Lily and Tori, are blocking the front door. But the horror doesn't end there. In the chaos, they find Monica lying on the floor bleeding profusely. Her throat slashed, her wrists and ankles also cut, yet somehow she clings to life. It's like something straight out of a thriller novel, but this is all too real. So what in the world happened here? To unravel this chilling scene, let's rewind the clock and dive into the events leading up to this terrifying moment. Let's start with a glimpse into Monica McCarrick's early years. Born in 1983, her childhood seems to have been uneventful except for one stark reality. She grappled with various mental health challenges, including major depression and ADHD. Doctors trace the roots of her depression back to when Monica was just 12 years old a pivotal year that would shape the course of her life. Fast forward to 1995 and the situation takes a darker turn. Police reports and medical records reveal a troubling pattern. Hospitalizations for suicidal ideation and self-inflicted wounds, and that's not all. Monica herself says she began experimenting with substances like weed and alcohol at the tender age of 12. But as time marched on, the drugs only got harder. LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, and eventually her favorite methamphetamine. Monica was on a downward spiral of drug abuse. Then, suddenly her life took a significant turn in 2007. She was going to be a mom of twin girls, but it wasn't exactly smooth sailing. Let's just say her relationship with her baby's father wasn't exactly sunshine and rainbows. Details about him are scarce, but it seems he made a swift exit from the picture after the girls were born, leaving Monica to navigate parenthood alone. While he stayed put in San Diego, Diego, she packed up and headed across the country to Pennsylvania for a fresh start. The little family of three was happy there. Monica found work as a dental assistant and was going to school to further her career, all while embracing the joys and struggles of raising her two precious daughters. Then their story took an unexpected twist. As luck would have it, Monica crossed paths with an old flame from the West Coast, reigniting a connection that would ultimately change the course of her life. Now let's dive into her new love, Robert Paulson's part in Monica's story. They had a history history that spanned about a decade, but life had pulled them in different directions and they lost touch. However, fate had other plans. It was around Thanksgiving in 2009 when they stumbled on each other again 
thanks to that digital Cupid, Facebook. Before they knew it, they were picking up right where they left off. Talk about perfect timing, right? Robert had recently ended things with his ex and Monica was also single. Despite the 2,600 mile distance between them, they decided to give long distance love a shot. But just when they thought things were falling into place, fate threw them a curveball. In April 2010, Robert's ex tragically took her own life using one of his own guns. It was heartbreaking, but Monica was there for Robert every step of the way. And by May 2010, their bond had grown so strong, they took the leap and got engaged. It was going to be them and the twins against the world. This little circle of love in a dark world. So after Robert popped the question, Monica thought, all right, it's time to head back west. With a little help from Robert's mom, they made the move to Fairfield, California in August 2010. Monica was all about being closer to her man, but Robert's job wasn't exactly conducive to family time. Just when they were starting to feel at home, September 9th rolls around and Robert's boss tells him, sorry buddy, we need you in Minnesota. Pack for a five-week stay. Talk about bad timing. So there's Monica holding down the fort while Robert's off bringing home the bacon. She's not working just yet, but she's going through the steps to take the state exams so she can dive back into a dental assistant job. In the meantime, Robert's got her back, making sure the bills are covered while she holds down the fort with the kiddos. It's unclear if he knew about her drug use. She began using meth again shortly after he left. Here's where things take a dark turn. About two Two weeks into Robert's business trip, Monica stumbles on a screenplay he's been cooking up with a buddy. It's not your run-of-the-mill script. It's a full-blown slasher flick, complete with creepy beach stalkers and an ending where, you guessed it, everybody dies. Now, if that's not enough to make you raise your eyebrows... Just wait. Monica's not just upset by what she finds, she's downright disturbed. Why? Because she's convinced Robert wrote this terrifying story about her and her twin girls. Yes, you heard that right. She thinks it's all part of his twisted plot to lure her and the girls back to California, only to, well, let's just say she doesn't envision a happy ending. So Monica confronts Robert head-on about her suspicions. He tries to brush it off, assuring her it's all just fiction, but Monica's not buying it. She's on to something big, something Robert doesn't want her or anyone else to know. And here's the kicker. Her gut is telling her he's not planning this alone. He's probably got a whole team backing him up. One of his supposed operatives is the UPS delivery guy. He's probably definitely been making more than just package drops. She's got the feeling he's been inside probably more than once. Then there's the mysterious figure parked outside waiting and watching. It's enough to keep her and the kids locked in the apartment. But the paranoia doesn't end there. One day, Monica catches wind of a Facebook post from one of Robert's buddies. It's a story about a breakup involving Dobermans, tasers, and rounds. He's trying to pass it off as a joke, but Monica's convinced it's aimed right at her. If you ask Robert, Monica's mood swings are all over the map at this point. He spends hours on the phone trying to talk her down, but it's like she's on this roller coaster of suspicion and fear. Robert's due back home on October 11th, and it's getting close to the end of September now, so he's counting the days. Once he's back, he figures he can finally set the record straight. All he's got to do is get through this trip, and he can clear up this whole mess face-to-face. Easy, right? Well, wait and see how it all plays out. Back in California, Monica turns to her old friend Meth to get her through it, but it only jacks up her paranoia. That's when her friends start getting some very weird messages from her. One friend from Pennsylvania said Monica was worried Robert and his family were out to get her and the girls. On September 25th, she got this text. My fiancé Robert Paulson and his mom are acting strange, so FYI, if I end up missing or turn up dead or they try to say I committed suicide, suicide, it's a cover-up, so feel free to get revenge for me. Hold the phone, literally. Can you even wrap your head around getting a text like that from your friend? Well, 
You bet this girl wastes no time calling. Monica's convinced Robert's chatting up other women on Facebook because in her mind, their relationship's on the rocks and Monica's still on edge about the terrifying fantasies he's been writing about in his screenplay. A few days later, Monica texts another friend. They want to steal the girls and kill me, I think. A third friend gets this text. He scares me. I feel like he is going to hurt me. I never meant to hurt him. I need to know I am safe. So hopefully, this is a paranoid delusion, but I'm telling you, if I end up missing or turn up dead and or they say I tried to commit suicide, it's a cover-up. Hold up, let's rewind for a second. Remember Robert's ex, the one who tragically took her own life with his gun? Well, Monica's remembering that too, and her suspicions start to kick into overdrive. She's got this gut feeling that maybe, just maybe, Robert had something to do with it, like he orchestrated the whole thing to look like a suicide. And get this, he's got a whole arsenal stashed away at home including some seriously sharp samurai swords. Monica's mind is racing. Any one of those weapons could be turned against her and her precious girls. Feeling trapped and desperate for a way out, Monica decides it's time to hit the road. So, on September 29th, she packs up the girls and hightails it to San Diego to hide out with her family. She shows up at her mom's place, clutching Robert's creepy horror movie script like it's the smoking gun she needs to prove he's out to get her. She's all frazzled and jittery, but her mom's doing her best to calm the storm. And it actually seems to work. Over the next few days, the tension melts away and the next thing you know they're off on a wedding dress shopping spree like nothing ever happened. Monica and the kids leave on October 4th but she doesn't go home just yet. Instead she decides to spend a few days at her future mother-in-law's house for a pizza party and a cozy sleepover. Things take a seriously wild turn here. Picture this. It's the dead of night and Monica sneaks off to the garage for a hit. When she comes back she's convinced the pizza they ate was laced with poison. She grabs the twins and bolts. It doesn't matter that it's the ungodly hour of two or three in the morning. She's outside putting the girls in their car seats when she spots a shadowy figure lurking in a car down the street. Monica goes into panic mode. Her future mother-in-law tries to calm her down, telling her, no, no, it's just my early bird neighbor heading off to work. But even after they're safely in the car, Monica's still on edge, texting her to make sure it's safe to leave, then checking in once they're home, letting her know they made it back in one piece. In Monica's mind, every day is playing out like one of her favorite James Patterson novels. By October 10th, she's at rock bottom mentally. Then, Robert gets some bad news. He can't go home just yet. He has to fly straight to Alaska for another 10 days. Monica takes the news pretty hard, but not for the reason you might think. She's upset because Alaska is where she assumes the slave camp is. The apartment complex's assistant manager is one of the last people to see Monica on the morning of October 12th. She asked her to move her car because it was blocking other spots. If it was anyone else, Monica wouldn't have left the apartment, but because the manager is pregnant, Monica doesn't think she's a threat. Robert is the last person to hear from Monica that night. In one message, she referenced robot butterflies, ending the text with, you will never have me again. In another message, Monica asks Robert to talk to the girl's father. Tell him to let the bunnies go so we can keep what's ours. Defending them is the number one most high on your priority list. She sends two more odd texts. One just says, tick tock. The other says, Read James Patterson. When he calls, it sounds like she's running around the apartment rambling nonsense. She'd hang up, he'd call back, more ranting, hang up, call back, rant. Then she stops answering the phone. The next time he hears from her, it's hours later. She says, if Tori and Lily are okay, tell them it was an accident. We are going to make a fire. We are going to make a fire. Then the call drops. At the same time, Monica's downstairs neighbor hears loud thumping coming from her apartment. Then the fire alarm goes off. He sees smoke pouring out of Monica's door and windows. He manages to break in through the sliding glass door in Monica's bedroom. As he's feeling his way through the thick smoke, he spots a sword and a bottle of pills in the hall. Firefighters force the front door open, but when they see what was blocking it, they realize this is much more than an apartment fire. The bodies of three-year-old Tori and Lily were propped against the door. Their killer wasn't some mysterious figure ripped from the pages of a James Patterson thriller. It wasn't their soon-to-be stepfather playing out a chilling screenplay. The most terrifying presence in their lives? Their own 
Mother. Monica took the sword to her own throat, wrists, and Achilles tendon. EMS rushed her to the hospital while her girls were taken away in body bags. In the apartment, police found the girls' high chairs overturned and covered in blood. Police think she strapped them into their chairs to make it easier. The girls didn't have any smoke in their lungs. They were both dead before their mother started the fire. Monica made her first court appearance on October 26, 2010. She was shackled to a wheelchair. Her arms and legs were wrapped in bandages. Prosecutors were left reeling by one shocking revelation. Her toxicology report came back squeaky clean. No cocaine, no meth, heck, not even a drop of alcohol in her system at the time. All those horrific things, she did them stone cold sober. She pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Doctors testified her depression got worse after the move to California. Then there was her long-term meth use. That can lead to paranoid delusions, but in California, you don't get a pass if the reason you're insane is because of your chronic drug use. Monica McCarrick was found guilty and sentenced to two life terms in prison without parole. At her sentencing, Monica told the court, I love Tori and Lily more than anything in the world. In her delusional mind, she was protecting them from a fate worse than death. 